Is Mexico's so-called war on drugs about to come to an end? President Peña Nieto unveils a new strategy that seems to repudiate the policies of his predecessor. And Ecuadorians go to the polls on Sunday. Rafael Carrera is an overwhelming favorite to be re-elected, but he's facing growing criticism from the left. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. The election of Enrique Peña Nieto last year marked the return to power of the Industrial Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, that had ruled the country for 71 years prior to the year 2000. Peña Nieto promised that the PRI was no longer a party of patronage and corruption, but a modern force focused on economic growth, poverty reduction, and tackling the drug-related violence unleashed during the presidency of Felipe Calderón. This week, the president unveiled his plan to tackle crime and take on the cartels. He appeared to reject Calderon's policy of force, instead promising to approach the problem through a $9 billion investment in social programs to address the root causes of crime. Nonetheless, thousands of troops remain on the streets as the war on drugs continues. We're joined from Mexico City by Camilo Perez Bustillo, who is a professor of human rights at the Autonomous University of Mexico City. And in the studio, Stephen Dudley. He's a fellow of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Let's run through some of the key points then off uh, President Peña Nieto's plan. The government says it will spend $9.2 billion this year on social programs designed to keep young people from joining gangs. It's not clear, though, how much of that money is funding that's already been announced as part of other programs, though. Uh, the initiatives include road building, improved health and social services, help for single mothers to find jobs, better park grounds and lighting and increasing school hours. The money is targeted at 251 towns and neighborhoods considered the most violent in Mexico. Professor Perez Bustillo, um, on the face of it, isn't this pretty enlightened stuff? Isn't this exactly what many people have been calling for? Uh, I think on its face, at the surface, I think the bottom line is all of this is nice talk so far, is good rhetoric. Uh, Peña Nieto is a very carefully staged, managed creation of Mexico's largest media monopoly, Televisa, and its ostensible rival, Azteca, who joined together essentially to promote his candidacy from the moment he appeared on the national scene as governor of the largest state. The Peña Nieto campaign was carefully managed in the same way. We're seeing a lot of that reproduced in these last couple of months as he stepped into the shoes of power. But the bottom line is I think we've seen very little real change on the ground. The bottom line is that Mexico continues to be a state which systematically violates human rights, which has a catastrophic record over the last six years of over 100,000 dead. It's truly equivalent in many ways to what we hear about Syria, but much more silenced, unfortunately, in the global media as well. All right. So I welcome this opportunity to help pierce that veil a little bit. But it's only been two months, uh, and, and $9.2 billion is a great deal of money. I mean, you've got to give them a chance, haven't you? Well, I think this is clearly an issue of implementation. I think that's the bottom line. We can't take it at face value. I think what we have to look at is the record that has accumulated over the last six years, and in fact, over the last 80 years, when essentially the same political regime has been in power. Mexico has never had a democratic transition. Mexico has never had a national truth commission. There's never been full accountability for the crimes committed by the party that Peña Nieto now heads and represents in the uh, equivalent of the White House here, Los Pinos. So the bottom line is he's got a historical record to account for in terms of where he comes from and the currents of power that he represents and to which he gives concrete expression. So I think we're entitled to a great deal of skepticism starting off. And I think we have to look way beyond the rhetoric of what actually is going on in the ground. Nothing has changed if you look at the most conflictive regions of Mexico. 
in those regions where human rights violations are most concentrated in the southeast of the country and in the border region, in states like Guerrero, in states like Chiapas, nothing has changed on the ground and people's living conditions and sense of security continue to deteriorate. Clearly, Peña Nieto has woken up and smells the coffee. He knows that he has to put something on the table. And so we're back to essentially a recycling of the PRI's traditional populism with a technocratic face. I think it's time that people woke up in the U.S., in policy circles, in Congress, and throughout sectors of civil society in the U.S. to recognize that there's a human rights emergency in Mexico and that Peña Nieto and the regime he heads are part of the problem and a very unlikely source of any significant solutions All right. beyond the rhetoric. Stephen Dudley, can you see any real change in the war on drugs in Mexico as described there so far by President Peña Nieto? You know, I think the professor laid out uh, broad points of concern. I think those things, th those, those concerns are valid uh, in, in the widest sense. Um, and certainly this speech was an attempt to check off a number of boxes and differentiate himself from the Felipe Calderon administration, which many widely viewed as a failure with regards to, to the drugs, to the fight against organized crime. Um, and in drug trafficking. Even Felipe Calderón seemed to acknowledge that, actually, that, that it was an impossible task. Look, the, these, are, these are very difficult tasks, and that's, that's the matter that I would speak to more, that these are incredibly difficult things to resolve. Uh, putting $9 billion uh, towards this would be a great step um, in a different direction, in a softer direction, in a direction that certainly the country needs to go. However, um, as the professor pointed out, one of the things that we have a problem with with regards to the pre from the get-go is this lack of transparency. Uh, from the beginning, we have not known that much about what is going on and what is going forward. And I don't think we can actually expect that much transparency with regards to how the money is actually implemented and the results that we will get from that, from that particular, from those particular programs. That's things that are troubling for us. Aside from that, we also have a, a type of criminal organization, uh, right. criminal situation, which is showing signs of getting worse. Not necessarily perhaps in the numbers, which is somewhat flatlined in terms of numbers of homicides, but in terms of the, the spread of the violence. It happens in many more municipalities and states than it did several years ago and appears to be continuing that spread. Well, what happens then to the, the militarized approach, Stephen, as far as we can tell? I mean, it does the war on drugs continue even as these purported social programs that are about to be put into uh, into action as, 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 you know, concurrently with those, then? I don't think there's any question that the hard side, as in the military side and the use of federal police and other methods on the hard side, will continue parallel with the soft side. I think that both of these sorts of, imp of, of, of measures are needed in a case like Mexico and many other countries. So we can't ignore that, although he put all the emphasis on the soft side. I don't think there's any question that the hard side will continue in much the same way but as you say it did needed, in the Felipe but, but administration. But you also accept that it's been a failure of the last, over the Calderon administration. There. So, I mean, is this approach needed or should there be a completely different approach, perhaps? I absolutely think that, that both sides are needed. You have to, you have to implement both sides simultaneously uh, to varying degrees. Of course, you know, this is, this is where the devil's in the details. And one of the things that we'll have, a tr we'll have trouble with, I believe, and already are having trouble with, is this notion of transparency, is, this, is a true understanding of, of how this program will be implemented and, going forward, the results that we should expect. Professor, I mean, can you see any indication that Peña Neto will um throttle down on the, 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 the militarized approach of Calderon in battling the cartels. I mean, it was, some people wondered whether you know, the pre's you know, uh, policy in the past was perhaps to come to an accommodation with some cartels, quieten mm -hmm. things down. It's perhaps in their interest and their, and their financial interests and their business interests to calm things down a bit. You make an accommodation, you get an equilibrium with some cartels, because you know, you're not going to do anything about demand in the US. I mean, <clears throat> that, that, that was what some people wondered whether we, we, we'd be heading towards. Is it, might that be going on? Sure. You know, the bottom line is, you know, I'm a lawyer. There's no evidence, none, of a fundamental shift in the overall policy. I think as Stephen was describing, we've got the velvet glove, but within it and at its core is an iron fist. And that fist continues to have its grip 
on the lives, safety, security, and enjoyment of rights of the Mexican population as a whole. And that has not changed. Whatever happens with this $92 billion, and let's see how much of this was previously budgeted, and how much of this is new, and how much of this is simply relabeling and recycling. The bottom line, I think also, as Steve was alluding to, this was the approach in Colombia. Mexico continues to be trapped in the application to the Mexican context of what were the supposed lessons of Plan Colombia. When Plan Colombia was first implemented in Colombia, in, in Colombia 80 to 90 percent of the budget was essentially on the soft side. Most of the money was not in the iron fist, but everything was interrelated and coordinated. And what resulted was a now 15 year period since Plan Colombia was first implemented of extraordinary human rights violations, mass displacement, and the emergence of paramilitary forces as the brokers in the supposed anti-drug struggle with mixed anti-drug and counterinsurgency motivations. That's exactly what's beginning to happen in Mexico on the ground if you look at what's going on in regions of intense conflict such as Guerrero. We have the emergence of paramilitary forces there and in other regions of the country. It began with the so-called Zeta cartel in the north, but now we see it spreading exactly as Stephen was suggesting. But the key thing is all of this is in complicity with the government. When we talk about crime in Mexico, I think we have to remember something very important. The government and the state in Mexico has been immersed in criminal activity permeated by criminality since its origins. That's the old PRI that you're referring to, and that old PRI never went away. And what Peña Nieta has done is bring it back, repackaged for a new generation, reloaded 2.0, but the essence remains the same. The terror at the heart of that project is what creates these massive human rights violations, and they're being committed with US funding, complicity, training and support. Uh, so Professor we need though, Congress to act and others. Uh, I mean, Stephen Dudley though was saying, look, you do need though, you know, the, the, the soft power approach along with the, uh, the, the militarized approach. And, and perhaps if, if you get the balance right, you know, that might help the situation in Mexico. W would you agree with that? What would you say should be the policy? I think the bottom line is this. What are the lessons we have from around the world of similar struggles? Colombia is the closest, most analogous case and the lessons of what was done in Colombia in the name of combining so-called soft power and hard power was a disaster. So the devil, I agree with Steve, is in the details, but the bottom line is we have no reason to trust based on history and based on his own record an extraordinary inexperience that Peña Nieto is the man. What is the solution, his Professor? Team is the team that can take this on. So what is the route? Successful. What is the successful I think route? The route? I think the route has to begin with respect for the rule of law, for human rights, and a serious process of democratic transition in Mexico. The complete dismantling of the prior regime, and unless, unless Peña Nieto is ready to become the Frederick de Klerk in the South African context, or the Gorbachev in the Russian context, or find some other analogy that's more uh, suggestive to you, unless he's willing to take on that kind of role of transforming the system from within, given the lack of transparency that Steve has so correctly pointed to, we have no reason to trust the man in charge. At Steve, this moment. Stephen Dudley, how is the U.S. Uh, looking at, uh, at these developments? Certainly Peña Nieto is, is, certainly, is making noises that suggest he's no longer um, as um, wedded to doing the U.S.'s bidding anymore. But is, is that really the case? And, and would the U.S. even allow a, a fundamentally different course of action to, to, to take place? I think that that's real. I think that there there is a sense within the United States government that he is taking some positions and even within some of his own institutions sort of blocking off uh, access to United States institutions that previously had access under the Calderon administration. So that is real. 
Now, what that leads to down the road is, is harder to say because the United States-Mexico relationship is so complex. It, it went from a period of being very cold to being very hot, and now we're getting a little bit colder again. So we don't know where that's going to lead. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the U.S. presence and the amount of U.S. money is minuscule in the larger scheme of things. We are talking about percentage points of the total security budget. So how much they really depend on the United States aid to actually attack organized crime is very debatable. The, the, there the, are further the, economic ties, though, I suppose, is what we're There talking. are a number of further economic ties, that they, levers that right. they could use in order to pressure them. But again, it is, their, it is a very important ally. You, you're playing that dangerous game of do you want to isolate them or do you want to keep them as close as you possibly can in spite of the consequences, in spite of the cold shoulder. And the PRI has its own in. dynamics, I suppose, which, aren't which, which are perhaps more based in Mexico. Absolutely, and I think that both sides are still filling each other out. Right. I think we are still early days here. We, we need to see how this plays out a little bit, both in terms of what the soft side projects are and in terms of what the hard side projects are. When I talk hard side, I'm not just talking about a military presence, I'm talking about what the professor is talking about, institution building, creating strong justice institutions, this sort of thing, creating police that are accountable to their people, and creating these types of, uh, you know, human rights safeguards and uh, being able to sort of prosecute people who are breaking the law, whether That's they're the on test. the side of the state or outside of the state. Stephen Dudley, thank you very much. Professor Camilo Perez Bustillo, thank you, thank you as well. Now to Ecuador, where Rafael Correa is already the longest-serving president Ecuador has had in a century, despite only having come to power in 2007. And all the indications suggest his leadership is certain to continue after Sunday's presidential election. The closest among the seven candidates challenging him is the former banker Guillermo Lasso from the right-wing movement Creating Opportunities Party. And third is another conservative, the former president Lucio Guterres. But Carrera is also being challenged from the left. Candidates like Alberto Acosta, who once served as Carrera's energy minister, but now believe the president has abandoned his core principles in favor of oil exploration and big business. I'm joined by Deborah James. She's director of international programs at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Deborah, clearly this commanding lead Carrera holds is due in large part on his economic record. I mean, how, what is the state of the economy right now in Ecuador? Well, it's certainly doing a lot better than it has in the past. It's important to understand uh, the history a little bit with Ecuador. From 1980 to 2000, they actually had a decrease in their GDP of about 14 percent with an enormous um, economic crisis in 1999 that was brought about by the financial sector. And at that time, they had a lot of uh, privatization that happened, um, and they actually went to a dollar economy. So this has severely limited um, the tools that Korea has had to deal with the crisis um, in when they experienced a financial crisis like any other uh, country in, in uh, 2008. They had a great fall off in remissions, uh, that's money sent from overseas, and also from uh, their oil sector, which, you know, the oil price revenues decreased about 79 percent in that one uh, in, you know, right at that time at the crisis. And so he really had a conundrum and was able to um, have the economy recover only uh, one year after the recession. In the recession, they only lost 1.3 percent of GDP, which is incredible, um, considering that, the, you know, that they lost over 30 percent of their government, government revenue in one year. Um, and he's really put the country on the road back to prosperity. They had a 7.8 percent GDP increase in uh, 2011. And it'll be something like four to five percent uh, uh, last year. So you know they're doing far better. They brought uh, poverty down by 27 percent, and unemployment is actually at a record low of about 4.1 percent. So it's really um, just an incredibly you know doing much more, much better, much more stable, uh, prosperous economy than it ever has been. Uh, and I know you, your. Uh your group, the, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, is just coming out with a report suggesting that there's a model or there are lessons to be learned here, that the sort of policies that Korea took uh, can be used by other economies then to, to, um, to get away from perhaps the neoliberal economic consensus and, and, and survive and prosper. But what sort, of, what sort of things are we talking about there? Yes. Well, he has used a very interesting mix. They have a development plan that is based on their constitution that was popularly approved. 
um, and it really included a mix of uh, both fiscal stimulus and regulatory reform. Um, on the fiscal stimulus side, they did 5% uh, of GDP investment in the economy. A lot of this was in the construction sector, about $600 million in construction, also in uh, other infrastructure and healthcare and education spending. So the kind of things that really improve people's lives as well as inject funding into the economy to re-stimulate and get it going. Would that we had had that big of a stimulus program in the United States. On the financial side, um, really quickly, I'll just mention there's nine different things that Correa did, which is kind of incredible. Um, the first one is that he got control over the central bank. And as you know, this is an orthodoxy within neoliberalism that the central bank must be independent. That actually means independent of public oversight, but it's often acting in the interest of the financial sector. He brought that under government control, and that enabled them to actually bring $2 billion worth of reserves back into the country. Um, which was then used on that social spending, much of that that I had mentioned. They also stabilized the banking sector, meaning that they actually forced the banks to pay into a stabilization fund, like many progressives have been calling for, certainly in the United States and other countries, that would pay for a bailout fund if they needed it. And he also forced them to increase the amount of liquidity that they held domestically to 60 percent, so that again brought more money home. Um, the third thing, he actually increased the taxes on the financial sector, so on money that was leaving the country, as well as on banks' assets. He also um, created more regulatory agencies, and he increased the amount of, of uh, spending that banks, loans that banks had to give for what's called the solidarity sector, so uh, community banks, um, uh, credit unions, money that would actually be more in tune with community needs and go towards um, more... Uh, small local businesses in the area. I'm going to stop you at number four or five, I think that okay. was, because we're going to run out of time otherwise. But it's interesting, as you, as you talk about uh, Korea presenting an alternative economic model for mm -hmm. countries, there is this challenge from the left. We have uh, Alberto Acosta only polling about 3%, but, 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 but arguing, though, that in many ways, certainly when it comes to uh, mining and extraction, extractive industries, he has more in common with neoliberal policies than he does with anything progressive. Um, specifically, the, the, the exploration in the Amazon region, uh, where despite opposition from in indigenous groups who live there, he's going ahead with various projects. The government auctioned off the rights to 13 oil blocks in the Amazon last November. Uh, Careers allowed Chinese and Canadian firms to begin gold mining in forests sacred to indigenous groups. Some activists have been prosecuted for their opposition and indigenous activists accuse the government of not consulting them over water rights. They say large-scale mining will deplete and pollute water supplies. In fact, there's an effective privatization of some of the water supply in some, some regions. These don't seem like very progressive ideas, is the argument. Well, I certainly, you know, I'm not here to say that every single thing that, that Correa has done um, has been perfect. I mean, there could be very well things that, that you or I might disagree with that he's done. These issues are under a very big live debate within Latin America about how to balance the needs of poverty reduction and growing the economy versus the environmental conservation. And Correa is obviously following a plan. He also has very big fights and has been criticized quite a bit from the right. Um, the right candidate, as you know, is polling much higher under, you know, than the left candidate, unfortunately. He's vastly increased the amount of money that the, that the country is getting for the public coffers from the oil company. So he really has taken them on. Um, including uh, the financial sector quite a bit and some of the reforms that we mentioned. So he's really taking on some of the big traditional power bases of the country um, in the oil sector and finance. And I think he's you know, chosen a development path. Could there have been a better one? You know, it's hard to say. He's probably you know, done the best of, of perhaps any Latin American leader, certainly any leader in Ecuador's history. And it's really, I think, up to the left to keep pushing those issues. It's great to see that happen because that's how you know, the country will, will take more seriously those uh, type of proposals. But, but can that, can that debate ever really be won, though, in Venezuela, for example, or Ecuador, that, you know, in order to create the equitable society, you need the money. In order to get the money, you need to uh, engage in mining and extractive industries that might be destroying the planet. I mean, how, how do we get out of that? Well, I think that um, many academics in Latin America and social movements would certainly point to um, other ways that the economy can be developed that aren't necessarily dependent on mining or oil revenue. Now, is that possible in Ecuador in the short term and reducing poverty? I think the Ecuadorian government has decided that you know, there's a certain amount of poverty reduction that needs to happen right away, given the dire situation. And they have focused on channeling the resources from those extractive industries into healthcare, into education, into construction, into stabilizing the economy. And they've done a phenomenal job of that. Um, so the fact that those, that those uh, you know, critiques continue is good. People who are negatively affected by those industries should be voicing their concerns and 
you know, I think the government will, as far as we've, you know, take them into consideration as they go forward. Deborah James, thank you very much. Thank you. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net.